Hi, my name is Bill Hunt and I am a professor at NC State University and I am thrilled to be here uh, recording this video in, the, in Waterloo, Ontario. And the presentation today is about how you can use stormwater management on streets specifically. Our focus is going to be not necessarily maybe this level of stormwater integration along a street, but what are the types of practices that you can use to on a, on a street to treat its stormwater runoff and also provide other benefits like aesthetic improvement and, and shielding people, for example, from, from air pollutants. Um, but then also, we're, the first thing we're actually going to talk about is a little study that, that demonstrates what smart use of these practices can actually do for you from a runoff perspective. So getting back or getting to the original uh, idea of how much stormwater management installation is needed to achieve discernible runoff reduction and pollutant load improvement. And we did a study on this in the city of Wilmington, North Carolina, close to the, the Atlantic coast. And what we had at this particular site were two catchments that we monitored. One uh, stayed as a control catchment. We didn't make any changes to it. And the second one we monitored and then we installed a series of stormwater practices and monitored it after the installation. The types of practices that we use included bioretention. You can see the dividing line for the bioretention and which one of these two facilities was actually in our catchment. Please keep in mind that we actually did put some trees in it or shrubs in them as well. It wasn't just depressions with mulch. Then we had permeable pavement. We had a pair of installations of permeable pavement. We had to install a few flow diverters to get the water to access more of the pavement surface, essentially trying to keep the water from only flowing in the gutter. And then finally, we used a proprietary system, a filter unit, that uh, was designed, and you can see it installed on the right, that was designed to be a flow-through device so that all the water would pass on one side of the street would pass through this device before leaving our catchment. I apologize for that little spasm of slides. Here are the results. I want to I want to draw your attention to the LID calibration, which is um, number which is 0 0.38, and compare that to the LID treatment, which is 0 0.18, essentially a 50% reduction. And what those two numbers represent is the amount of runoff that uh, left the site as expressed as a fraction of the amount of precipitation. So in other words, with LID slash calibration, 38% of the rain ran off our site. With the LID treatment, 18% of the rain, or essentially half of the rain, ran off our site. <clears throat> and what is so awesome to note is that is essentially the exact amount of directly connected impermeable, impermeable surface reduction that we saw. We dropped from 24% of direct connection impervious surface down to only 12. And so the, the volume of runoff essentially aligned with the amount of impervious surface disconnection that we had. And uh, that is an incredibly good result. And it also leads one to understand that where you put your practices along the streetscape can have a pretty significant difference. As you look at pollutant loads, I will point out a few really good numbers. Those are they, all in bold, in a big black box. And everywhere across the globe, people worry about total suspended solids, TSS, or the amount of sediment that's leaving. 
and I want to draw your attention to the 91% reduction in sediment load that was observed after we put in the low impact development practices along the streetscape. And so if people ask, does it make a difference? It does make a difference, both from a hydrologic or runoff generation standpoint, and then very much so from a pollutant removal standpoint. Um, people would, I don't kill is probably too strong a word, but people would be very, very happy to have a 90% or 91% TSS load reduction. And that was achieved with minimal and strategic placement of practices along this streetscape. The next practice I want to discuss are uh, bioretention cells. And it's one of the practices that obviously was utilized in that study I showed you from Wilmington. Um, this picture is not from Wilmington. It happens to be in Seattle. But you can see the street to the right and the bioretention cell that has been integrated into the streetscape. Here is another example. This one is in New Zealand. And the roundabout, instead of being a, a small little hill, is actually a depression. And what looks like a chia pet, if, for those of you who can remember chia pets, well, those are vegetation growing very happily in the middle of a roundabout in as a part of a bioretention cell. So the idea of using bioretention in a road or as part of the roadscape certainly is employed all across the world. I want to point out how well bioretention works. Here is an example, a study that was conducted in uh, downtown Charlotte, North Carolina. This is admittedly not from a street, but it did receive runoff from a parking lot. And I will uh, point out a pair of hydrographs. The light green hydrograph, which essentially exits the chart and comes back and exits the chart again, that's the inflow hydrograph. And the orange uh, hydrograph, that's uh, the one at the very bottom that doesn't get above a 0 0.5 or essentially doesn't cross the 0.5 liters per second, that is the outflow hydrograph. And you can look at this, and this is what left the bioretention cell versus what came into the bioretention cell. And look at these data, and it shouldn't come as a shock to you, that the inflow hydrograph at one point was 50 times higher than the highest point of the outflow hydrograph, a 50 time peak flow reduction. Moreover, the volume of runoff entering was 20 times more than that of the volume leaving the bioretention cell. The rest of the water either went into the ground or evapotranspired. So from a hydrologic standpoint, bioretention really works well. To focus a little bit in on water quality, you will observe a tortoise in the upper right hand, it's actually a terrapin, and it's the symbol of the University of Maryland. And these slides are given to me by my colleague, Dr. Alan Davis at the University of Maryland. You will see inflow and outflow samples taken from two different paired bioretention cells. And in both cases, the inflow is a lot dirtier than the outflow. Well, we can put some data on that as well. And from those two sites that I just showed you the picture from, in terms of comparing sediment loads into and out from, you can see a significant uh, decrease. In fact, the red squares are paired with the blue circles. And so the red squares are the sediment concentrations coming in, and the blue circles are the sediment concentrations leaving a bioretention cell. And do note that it is a, uh, logarithmic scale and so that reduction actually reflects a greater than one tenfold improvement in quality of water going from the red squares to the blue circles. The other pair pairing are the brown triangles versus the green diamonds and again you're looking at approximately a, a tenfold reduction in concentration going from the, the inflow of 
the buyer retention cell of sediment versus the outflow. So these numbers are actually in line with um, what I showed you earlier from the, uh, the street in Wilmington. Extremely good performance. I want to talk about a derivation or a deviation from a, a bioretention cell, an above ground bioretention cell. And it, it, it circles back to the use of trees. If you look at cities across the globe, it is understood that incorporation of trees is a really good thing. For example, here's something from Lianyungang City in China. I have no idea if my pronunciation is correct, but I promise you, I just did the best I could. Here's another, rather, here's another example of trees being used alongside a, a, a street. Not a highly used street, but a street nonetheless, in Oviedo, Spain. And I, I wish that I had a great picture of trees from, uh, and I do. The highlight here, obviously, is a World War I memorial in London, Ontario. But um, this is a beautiful park in, in Center City or downtown London, and it's ringed with trees, including trees along the street. I, I apologize, I can't really demonstrate the use of trees along the street, but I'm sure it doesn't take any of you, any, any brain cell and imagination to figure out that, yeah, I can imagine these trees in this park or along the street. My point being is that no matter where you go across uh, the world, we embrace the use of trees for all the benefits that they provide. And there it has been some research as to how it directly relates, those, those tree benefits, how do they directly relate to stormwater? It has been demonstrated that as you increase urban tree canopy cover, your runoff volumes decrease, and it is due essentially to canopy interception. One study has shown that up to 36% of rainfall has been able to be captured in the leaves of trees and then later evaporated. That, folks, is pretty amazing. But what hasn't been done so much is taking a, a tree and trying to improve its growth by running water through it. Actually, I shouldn't say it hasn't been studied. It has been studied, where they will take water from a street and then route it into a, we'll call it a, a chamber system that is filled with the soil media and then allows the trees to grow. One such product, trade name, is the silva cell. And the idea is that you can get a silva cell, a tree to grow when you can have, allow its roots to, to expand freely. So what we decided to study was to take water off a street and route it into the silva cell to see if, in fact, it improved performance. Here is an example location of a silva cell. You're like, Bill Hunt, where is the silva cell? And the answer is, well, it's underground and it's hard to see, but those trees are able to take advantage of it. And, by, and therein lies the advantage of the silva cell is that you get to keep the same urban space that you want to use without having to sacrifice the land use. Your stormwater treatment essentially could be below ground. So we did a study where we looked at directing runoff from a street into a silva cell uh, and then essentially to look at the benefit of having water pass through a media that supports one tree. And at the time we conducted the study, we didn't have any real design guidance from which to go. So this was a proof of concept study that I'll be sharing with you. The next series of pictures are going to show you the construction of one of these cells uh, with interjection of construction of a second cell that should be relatively self-explanatory. So here is the site of a future silva cell. You can see a dilapidated sidewalk alongside a street. That is the street from which the runoff will be diverted. And you can see the excavation just starting. In fact, the first piece of concrete sidewalk is being ripped out of the ground. 
there is the basin into which the silver cell will go. And, and think about all of that room that the tree will have to send its roots. In the particular study that we conducted, we wanted to eliminate any water seeping out the bottom. The only possibility for water loss would be evapotranspiration. And so you can see that occurring here with this liner. This is not always needed. However, in some cases, if you are worried about utilities or foundations, that you, then you actually would want to go ahead and line the silver cell to eliminate water leaving by way of infiltration. Here is the gravel going in, and you can see the gravel is going in, in and amongst the deck and post system that is going to support the traffic. On the right hand side of the picture, you'll see a pipe, and that pipe actually is the underdrain for the silva cell that will be used to get the water out of the bottom of the silva cell. Here is a video that I will play of another silva cell being installed in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and you'll um, get an idea of the soil installation. I will also let you know that the siren was a freebie. There, in this particular picture, you can see the media getting close to the top and then how it was protected uh, at the end of the day. And then we're getting very close to the end, and I want to point out these two manifold pipe, these two white pipe that serve as the manifold. And the purpose of those was to distribute the water that came off the street. So the water would come off the street, flow along this manifold pipe, and then soak out the pipe. Uh, actually, I should say sort of flow out of the pipe so that it would then soak through the media. And remember, the media there is there for two purposes. One is to improve the quality of the water, but secondly, it is into that media that the tree roots will grow. And here we are with the final uh, uh, decking layer going down. You can see the access port. Uh, check on the under drains there. And uh, after, th after that, the burrito wrapping was completed, and then the uh, the, the backfill was completed. Here is the site. The new sidewalk is in. That little itty bitty tree. You think about that big basin was for that little itty bitty tree. We'll explain why that little itty bitty tree, which happens to be a crepe myrtle, was installed. Essentially, we had a power line we had to work under. We needed to be careful with the, the sight lines. Um, and we couldn't, we didn't, the city of Wilmington essentially didn't want a very big tree. So after all of that work, we ended up with a little crepe myrtle, which uh, was what the city of Wilmington felt comfortable with. Just as an aside. So about a year later, obviously an area in need of mowing, but that's beyond our control. You can see how the crepe myrtle was doing, which by the way, was very, very well. Here is another example of a silva cell. This one has permeable interlocking concrete pavers, a type of permeable pavement, as a, as a pretreatment. So just understand that this essentially, what I'm showing you, is very much like an underground bioretention facility. We studied the one in Wilmington, as I've alluded to, I think about four or five times at this point. And I'm going to go ahead and show you how well the system worked. This is our monitoring assembly. You can see where the water comes in off the street. And just imagine the water being distributed underneath that sidewalk with those tree roots eventually growing into that media. Looking at this graph, you can see all the rain that fell upon the watershed. And those are the black circles, the top line. 
you can see all of the runoff that bypassed. Those are the black triangles or the bottom line. And then uh, essentially, you're, you're, you're looking at the amount of water that was able to be treated and discharged. Now, almost all the water that fell on to the watershed actually left our cell, but most of it, about 80% of it, in fact, was forced to go through the media, all right? And in, in doing so, we saw two significant benefits. One of them was not runoff volume reduction because that didn't provide, the system was lined, it did not reduce volumes of runoff, as you can see in this direct comparison. However, one of them was peak flow mitigation. And it should make sense that when you force water to flow through a media, the media is going to meter out the flow. And therefore, the flow rates that were measured relative to what came in were a very tight, narrow bond, bound, were, very, were bounded very tightly. And it's because the variability was reduced because that water was flowing through a media. And again, the, the reduction was actually significant. We saw some pollutant Im improvement. For example, nitrate, nitrogen was removed and in great part that happened because the configuration of the cell, we had a saturated zone at the bottom and we had media and organics and microbes were living in it and they were able to essentially eat that nitrate, nitrite and convert it to nitrogen gas. So that's another really big benefit that um, the Silva cell provided. And if you look at a bunch of different pollutants, including sediment and metals, we were observing somewhere between 60 and 70% of all of those pollutants being retained in the site, which is great, great news. And remember, we didn't have any volume reduction, so all of that improvement is, is associated with changes in concentration that the Silva cell provided. And the other thing I want to remind everybody is that if we didn't have 20% of our runoff volume get bypassed, then these numbers would be even would be even higher and substantially so. Long story short, routing water from uh, streets through a device that's designed to grow along a street, a tree, go along a street with a tree that will grow and provide shade to the tree and shade to the sidewalk can provide really good benefits. Now we're going to talk about another practice that gets used along streetscapes and that practice is permeable pavement. There are many different types of applications. Uh, limited use residential streets, such as the one on the right, uh, which is from Denmark. Side street parking, a little busier street perhaps in, in a neighborhood. Um, a side street parking, as is the, what you see the picture there on the left. Here is uh, an alleyway, downtown Chicago, beautiful in the theater district. A, a pervious alleyway is being used there on the right. And on the left, it's another street uh, in New Zealand where the entire street was comprised of permeable pavement. So I hope it's clear that residential areas, both sort of ultra urban and more suburban, can be great places to use permeable pavement. The traffic does need to be relatively low as is the case in that ultra-urban example, as is the case with all of them, um, but namely in the ultra-urban example from Chicago, not a bunch of cars are passing through the alley. All right, they're on other streets. This is mostly a, a pedestrian corridor along with limited service vehicles. But do understand that permeable pavement can be used on lightly used streets. So we studied permeable pavement. We studied different types of permeable pavement. We, in fact, had one site that had three different designs, and we were able to observe how well the system worked. A little bit about the designs. The conventional configuration um, basically was 40 centimeters deep, 40 centimeters essentially of gravel. 
Um, I will talk a little bit about those jagged lines, but those jagged lines indicate that we prepared the subgrade by ripping it, which I'll show you a picture of in a little bit, to help improve infiltration. The second design employed creating a temporarily saturated zone, we call it internal water storage zone, in the bottom of the permeable pavement and increasing the depth of the permeable pavement by 30 centimeters. Obviously, that does cost a fair amount more, but in doing this particular design, we were able to store a whole lot of water, which I'll get to in a second. In the third design configuration, we had a, a gravel depth that was the same as the first one, a total of 40 centimeters, but we again created this internal water storage zone in the bottom 15 centimeters in an effort to help improve infiltration. In all three cases, we did prepare the soil to improve infiltration. And there you see the amount of water that would be able to be stored. In fact, I will point out that in the 30 centimeter, 30 centimeter deep internal water storage zone, we would be able to store somewhere around 12 centimeters of rainfall. And in the 15 centimeter zone, we would expect to be able to store roughly six centimeters of rain. So it would take a pretty substantial, but not unheard of event to produce outflow, particularly from the internal water storage shallow design. So how do we create the internal water storage design? Well, you can see the underdrain pipe about to go in and you can see that elbow associated with it. That elbow from the nape of the, or the invert of the uh, edge of the elbow down to the bottom is about 30 centimeters. And, and therein is, is how we were able to form or force this storage zone in the bottom of the permeable pavement. To prepare the soil, it was not rocket science. In fact, nothing I do is rocket science. We took a piece of rebar and we stuck it into the ground about 20 to 25 centimeters and then dragged that thing through the sub base. It's almost like tilling, but technically it's, it's called ripping. And, and it's a technology, if you want to call it technology, it's a procedure that was tested at uh, the University of Tennessee by John Tyner and some colleagues. And it worked so well there that we decided to bring it to North Carolina. So here are the data. We had 54 total rainfall events that occurred in, in the summer of 2012. Of those 54 rainfall events, from the conventional design, only eight of them produced outflow. There was no outflow from the deep internal water storage zone, which by the way was designed to capture a 12 centimeter rainfall, which is a big rainfall. And then the shallow uh, zone, shallow zone design had one outflow event. Again, it was designed to capture a six centimeter rain, which is also a big rain. In terms of the, the, the amount of reduction we saw volumetrically, we were looking at a 77, I'm sorry, we're looking at a 77% total volume reduction from the device that all we did special was rip the bottom of it. And if we included an internal water storage configuration by having an upturned elbow, we're able to improve our volume reduction all the way to 99.5%. So you probably can guess what we require of bioretention cells in North Carolina now provided we don't have highly plastic or high shrink swell soils underlying our permeable pavement. I want to stay on the, the permeable pavement discussion, but just talk about adapting our practices for use in a change of climate. We have worked with a colleague at the University of Tennessee and what he has done is project future rainfalls in different states across the eastern part of the United States, essentially from the Mississippi River to the east. And I apologize that this is only here um, 
these data are, are only here uh, for the United States of America, but I, I am going to show you some data from Ohio. So if you are watching this in southern Ontario, just think it's just across the lake. What this picture shows are projected rainfall differences between now and 2050. Anything that's dark green or green shows an increase in precipitation intensity and in amount. Anything that is white shows no change. Anything that's shade of brown actually indicates a, 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 a less intense projected future rainfall. And you can see it's highly variable. In fact, you can even see what's projected for Southern Ontario, which I didn't realize until I started looking at this picture, which makes me very, very happy. We specifically did our study that I'm going to show you data from for the northern part of Ohio along the, along the south shore of Lake Erie. And again, not terribly far away if you're viewing this in Waterloo, Kitchener, or London. Um, you're not very far away from you, just across the lake. The site that we conducted this mod, uh, model study on was in Willoughby Hills. And just to show you the permeable pavement there, you can see we had a fair amount of runoff coming onto the two different permeable pavement applications. The first thing you have to do is check whether your model actually gets it right with data that you know, because you obviously can't check and test something that's occurring in the year 2050, but you can use your model and the model procedures to check what happened, say, 10 years ago. And that's what we did. And you can see that the modeled versus the actual was very similar for um, uh, when you compare the two rainfall uh, numbers, both for the areas towards the east of Lake Erie and those towards the west. The east of Lake Erie would be Willoughby Hills versus in Cleveland Hopkins Airport. Um, and the west would be comparing Perkins Township to Old Woman Creek. So we felt comfortable that this model was projecting or predicting the right amounts of rainfall uh, based upon going backwards. So we felt comfortable going forward and applying future rainfall to our study site. So in short, this is what we found, that across the board, there was moderate decreases in total rainfall. However, at one of our sites, we saw an increase in the magnitude of extreme events. And the other one, we saw a decrease in the amount of extreme events. So as you might guess, it's kind of, it depends on where you are, whether how much of an impact you're going to see from this uh, increased rainfall or change in rainfall intensity and volumes. It is important to note that for across the lake, it would be considered a relatively moderate climate change if you're looking at Northern Ohio. And so what, is, so what does that mean if you're trying to design a future system? Well, you can see the baseline, for example, from this specific uh, site that we designed and, and monitored and then modeled that the uh, amount of surface runoff in the baseline condition was, was quite limited, about 2%. And in 2050, in those types of rainfall patterns, the surface runoff would bump up, in fact, somewhere into the 7 to 9% range. That would mean that we would have an increased amount of surface runoff. Now, there is a way, of course, of dealing with it. Oh, I should also point out that that means the the performance of the system, if you are in, have more water running off, that means you have less water being captured and going into the ground. So how do you fix this? Well, if you are trying to design for the future climate in Cleveland, Ohio, the answer would be that you, maybe you design your permeable pavement or your green street or your bioretention cell or whatever to store somewhere between two to five more millimeters of precip. So not a ton of change would be needed in, in Cleveland. 
Um, and therefore, the, the additional size of the practice you know, need not be particularly large. Now, I'm not going to show you this, but we did a similar study in North Carolina where the climate variability and climate change is expected to be significantly more. And in that play, in, in North Carolina, to achieve the same type of performance that you would expect from, from a design perspective, instead of increasing the storage to, by two to five millimeters of precip, we had to go between 10 and 15 millimeters of precip. And that, folks, does make a more substantial change to the bottom line or namely the cost of the practice. But anyway, across Lake Erie from Southern Ontario, it has some impact, but not a, a significant one in terms of stormwater control measure performance. Now let me talk a little bit about a um, proprietary system, and I did show you a picture of it earlier. It's called the Filtera unit, and uh, this is a schematic provided by Filtera. And the idea is water comes in off a paved surface, flows through a highly permeable uh, filter media, and then drains into the existing storm drainage network. What you are not seeing here is any infiltrative loss, and really hardly any evapotranspirative loss, because this, the system is very small relative to the watershed that contributes water to it. We studied uh, one of these standalone systems in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, it actually just got published and it's in the uh, Journal of Environmental Engineering's February issue. You can see where the study was. You can see the red star where the, uh, the, the filter unit was placed. You can see the drainage area that came to it. And you get an idea of where Fayetteville is and the whole scheme of things in terms of the state of North Carolina. What you see here are sediment concentrations. And you can see the inflow concentrations versus the outflow concentrations over the course of two different years. The inflow concentrations are all those circles. The outflow concentrations are all those squares. Again, you don't have to be a research scientist to look at that and say, hmm, total suspended concentrations dropped by an order of magnitude, like 90 plus percent. When you look at loads uh, coming in and leaving, you can see that when you start including the bypass water, the reduction is not quite as significant. It still is very high. We dropped from nearly 40 um, kilograms of, of TSS coming into our cell, and uh, that nearly 40 was reduced to 10 kilograms of sediment that either left by way of the effluent of the, of the filtera unit or in the bypass. So again, you're looking at you know, an 80%, 75% or 80% load reduction with this one simple system that, again, provides no volume, no volume mitigation. I will show you one little slide from nutrient standpoint. And again, the black circles are paired with the white circles. The black squares are paired with the white squares. And I want everyone to understand that the inflow concentrations for phosphorus were significantly and substantially higher than the paired outflow concentrations we got. In other words, the filter unit did a really nice job of also trapping phosphorus. Load-wise, as you include the volume that bypassed versus that which was just in the effluent, you're looking at a mitigation of, of about 50% of, of total phosphorus, a little bit less of dissolved phosphorus, but nonetheless, a very simple system that goes in to treat a parking lot or a road that honestly is pretty small relative to the contributing watershed is giving you a, a lot of improvement. So your take home point, and one of the things I wanna share with you, if you are doing work in an ultra urban area, consider grabbing what you can. Maybe you can't put a massive stormwater device, or you can't build a big underground storage facility, or even a big silva cell. Uh, ideally though, you might be able to put a silva cell in for several reasons. Grab what you can. Putting smaller practices in, in strategic places can have a big impact on reducing pollutant loads. 
just remember, if the system doesn't have infiltration as a part of it, as a part of its DNA, and it's relatively small relative to, to the contributing watershed, you're not going to see any significant improvements, substantial improvements to the hydrology of the site. I'm going to change gears a little bit from uh, certainly what we might consider downtown or center city applications or high density residential applications to a practice that would be used in suburban, suburban applications. Uh, and it is the vegetated swale. It is the most commonly used stormwater control measure in the world. It is designed for water conveyance. All right, um, they're placed along often more rural routes, but rural routes that can be residential as well. Um, and we've seen some improvement from studies across the globe. Uh, there are some things you can do to actually improve their performance as well. One of the improvements that I'm going to speak about is something called a bioswale. And the idea behind the bioswale is you have a specialized filter media that the water, as it flows through the swale, can actually flow into the media and eventually out via an underdrain. You can see an engineered example of a bioswale here, where you have the sod on top, a gravel layer in, into which an underdrain is, is, um, is placed. And then all of that is underlying a specialized uh, media, basically a permeable media that will let the water pass through. A couple other things about this media, for example, is that it had low phosphorus concentration, not a whole lot of organic matter. And all the whole idea behind that was to limit the amount of phosphorus that was going to be discharged. Here is a case, a little video, of a bioswale at work as it has been paired with check dams. Same at this point, though. I believe you. As you look at that video, you can see that the water stops at the second check dam. And that is because the check dam is, the two check dams are essentially forcing the water into the biomedia. And this is a way of improving not only the hydrology of, of the system, but very much so the water quality of the system. We are conducting those tests. This is actually a pretty recent video. Uh, I say recent video, it was, it was done in the autumn uh, a few months ago, and I don't have the data yet from exactly how well the system worked. However, I do have the data from a bioswale that was specifically put in place to reduce fecal coliform levels. The reason we are worried about fecal coliform levels is that when you have fecal coliform being discharged to beaches, which is a key staple of the economy in North Carolina. The beach. In fact, many of you watching have probably been to the Carolinas to go to the beach. I want to thank you very much for coming to visit our state and spending your money in North Carolina. Thank you. Because what we don't want to have happen is that people come to the beach, and, and this is actually a, the same type of situation only in uh, New Zealand, but the same type of thing where they had pathogens, coming into a, a beach and they don't want the kids to play in the water. They want people to play in the water because, ready for this, you can get sick. So we studied this bioswale along a coastal highway, not all directly along the coast, but feeding into uh, coastal waters. And you can see the overall design of the practice. Again, it's a relatively long swale. If you can look at this picture, you'll see the edge of the concrete channel. And essentially, when the concrete channel in the, in the background stops, the bioswale begins. The bioswale contained an underdrain. It, can, it was a V-cut. You can see it was a V-ditch, and it had the specialized high-flow filter media. And here is a couple of, of pictures of the monitoring diagram. Here's water coming in, and here is how we collected the runoff. 
And then we did have a couple of big storms that actually overwhelmed the swale, which was actually very handy uh, to have those bigger events and to really sort of test the effectiveness of the swale. We analyzed the storms to get an idea of how many storm events we had. And we had about 40 events produce a substantial amount of inflow. 71 total events, but 40 of them produce a substantial amount of inflow. And I want to point out that 27% of the storm, of 27 rather, out of 40 storms that we know came in and producing a substantial amount of inflow, completely infiltrated, which I think is fantastic. Um, we also had a lot of events that only had underdrain flow. If you look at the data, you can see the uh, number of uh, the concentration of water of, of different pathogens coming into the cell. And then you can see the concentration of, it's basically enterococcus, actually both of them, but concentration of enterococcus or fecal leaving the cell. Those are the, the gray and the, on the orange is the concentration of water leaving the cell. And you can see substantial uh, reductions not, you know, we're not talking 90% reductions, but we are talking substantial reductions in both cases. Um, and keep in mind that the scale that we're showing you is again logarithmic. The other deviation from a swale that I want to speak to today is something called biofiltration conveyance, also known as regenerative stormwater conveyance. And this works sort of in the backyards of neighborhoods. And you can see some examples of potential locations where a regenerative stormwater conveyance could be used. We would install them, recommend installing them on zero order streams. And here are again, some installations of regenerative stormwater conveyance used in Maryland and in North Carolina. Again, it's also known as biofiltration conveyance. It's one of those ideas, the test, the test of which came from a colleague of mine, uh, Ted Brown, Biohabitats. Um, he had pioneered this in Maryland and we decided that we would try it out. And I talked to my buddy with the North Carolina DOT. It's important having friends. I said, hey, Matt, are you interested in this idea? And he said, yes. And so he decided that we could use DOT, which is our transportation authority, to study how well these different things work because DOT has head cuts. And what they want to do is try to make those head cuts safer. So you can see essentially how a biofiltration channel slash regenerative stormwater conveyance will work. First, there's water that um, flows, if it's a big storm, will flow across, you know, riprap. Um, or rocks on the surface for energy dissipation. You get some groundwater, uh, water into the groundwater, or at least shallow groundwater through exfiltration. Some water will flow through a media and be filtered and essentially seep out. And then eventually there will be some vegetation that will take over and you get some vegetated treatment processes occurring as well. Here is an example of a regenerative stormwater conveyance during a large storm event um, in a neighborhood park. And again, this is the type of application that might make sense in neighborhoods. Our research sites, I'm gonna focus on two of them today. They were both at uh, Department of Transportation facilities. So just keep in mind that I didn't really study them in neighborhoods, but I, I do want you to note that um, the findings we had would be applicable in our minds if you were to use them as part of uh, residential streets as well, or receiving runoff from residential streets. The first one is back in Brunswick County, a location that has very permeable underlying soils. You can see the watershed or the catchment, pretty big catchment area, over five hectares. Um, the underlying soil was very permeable. And if you look, you'll see where the location of the 
regenerative stormwater conveyances. It's up near the creek. So it's basically the last thing the water sees before it gets discharged to the creek. You can see a schematic design and where we tested each of the uh, performance of each of these cells. And there is an example of one of our monitoring facilities, monitoring structure. We installed wells to look at the quality of water in the media and also determine how quickly water exfiltrated our site. In this, you get to see what a typical cross-section of, of this site, at least. I do apologize for the units being in U.S. customary. I try to convert most of my stuff. Apparently, I have forgotten. But hopefully, most of you are like, okay, I know 18 inches. I know 24 inches. In, in, in case you care, 24 inches would be what, 0.6 meters, and 18 inches would be approximately 0.45 meters. We were able to measure or calculate every aspect of the water balance for the site. I want to point that out because it will, it will um, enable you to understand how we got such high seep numbers, all right? So the seep is the, is the water that passed subsurface through the media and discharged out the back without being captured in surface flow or surface overflow. We also did measure exfiltration and evapotranspiration at this site. And so how well, cumulatively, did the system work? Well, we had 27% uh, events that produced runoff into the RSC. And that over from October 2012 to March 2014. And that, for a year and a half, that's actually not that many. But the reason there were only 27 is that it was a very permeable watershed. And... Um, the water is able to soak in the ground. But of those 27% that were sufficiently big, only two of them produced overflow. So cumulatively, 95% of the volume was taken away from surface overflow. A good chunk of that became seep out. 90% uh, peak flow mitigation from the worst event. So very, very good performance. These are some of the data that we used to estimate exfiltration rates. And those data were critically important to try to determine what happened with all the water, to all the water. And I want to point out that of a thousand liters that either flowed onto or fell onto our RSC, for every thousand liters, 840 of them left as seep out and only five of those thousand liters actually overflowed the site. Not a whole lot of them, by the way, evaporated or exfiltrated. Most of the water was essentially converted to seep out, which meant that it had been filtered and treated. And there's the summary. Now, we obviously realized it was important to get an idea of what the quality of the water might be if it's exposed to infiltration. And, and flow through the media. And so we were able to do that at this study site. It is again, similar to the one in uh, Brunswick County. It's, it serves a, uh, a, a, a DOT maintained watershed, uh, 1.6 hectares, about a little over three and a half acres. This one was uh, much more impervious and the underlying soils here were very tight. You can see the base design. It was comprised of three cells. I'm just going to blow through where we had our, our monitoring stations. I figured you guys are tired. <laughs> and this is what we had. We had 43 storms that produced uh, inflow to each of these things. The biggest one was um, not inconsequential. It was eight, over eight. Uh, eight centimeters. And for this site, we got great performance as well. Not quite as good as the site in Brunswick County, but still really good performance where almost 60% of the volume was able to be uh, mitigated in terms of converted, uh, some of it to uh, uh, infiltration, but most of it due to seep out. And then um, a, a substantial peak flow mitigation from the worst site. 
per 1,000 liters that came into this particular facility, um, you know, 20% of them overflowed, but still really very good. And about 770 of them were able to seep out, which again means that the water flow is being metered, it's seeping out more slowly, and is therefore being treated. From a volumetric standpoint, we were able to compare the amount of water that overflowed to that which you'd expect um, a pre-developed wooded condition to have. And you can see here that the blue diamonds and the green triangles are very, very similar, which shows you really good volume mitigation. From a peak flow standpoint, the same story compared to the, the post-developed condition, which we monitored the parking lot versus what we would have had this if this had been woods, we had really good peak flow mitigation occurring as well. We're very, very pleased with the hydrologic performance of this. Now from a quality standpoint, we had 20 events that we were able to collect water quality samples for. You can see the average inflow concentrations and you can see the average outflow concentrations. And across the board, each of these pollutants was substantially cleaner. In fact, in the outflow concentrations, I do want to point out that that second TP should be TSS. Please accept my apologies. You can see it graphically here, the inflow concentration versus the amount of sediment improvement that occurred after the first cell versus the uh, improvement associated with the second cell. And, and what you see here is essentially by the second cell, the lion's share of the improvement had occurred. And again, 72% of the median concentration of sediment was reduced all told by having the water pass through all four cells. You can see the changes for nitrogen. Again, good, not as, we'll say, powerful, but good relative to what we saw coming in. So the long story short with biofiltration channels or regenerative stormwater conveyance is that they work well. Hydrologically, the majority of the runoff, the vast majority of the runoff, is converted to something called seep out, which um, is cleaner water, filtered water. Some people may be able to argue that it's comparable to um, shallow groundwater interflow. From a water quality standpoint, it is, much, it is substantially cleaner and particularly um, sediment and, and, and or, or particulate pollutants, they're being strained as the water goes through this system. Long story short, we feel like biofiltration channels are a good practice that can be used to treat larger catchments in residential areas. They're not, they are, they can certainly be designed to not be uh, safety hazards, you, you can design them so you don't, you're not at risk of having um, someone drown in them because the water, the water depths are very similar, or very shallow rather. Um, and certainly they can be installed in eroded gullies and head cuts, which is a very safe situation uh, for that to be, you know, not having people falling into them. The last thing I want to mention is that I do know that in Southern Ontario, there's a fair amount of snow. In fact, I look out the window right now and I can see a lot of snow. So how do you treat snow with respect to your stormwater control measures along a street? First thing is, is we know um, that sand is going to be better than salt. And I have been told that many communities use a sand grit mix, as you see here in Maryland. Um, and that is, while it's rather unsightly in terms of when it gets piled up, um, it doesn't cause any damage to the plants uh, associated with salt. Um, if you are going to use salt, then you know, limit the salt application. Uh, bioretention cells, permeable pavement systems, green streets in general, they are not designed to take salt out. Salt is a, uh, is a tracer, essentially. Chlorine is a tracer, and we don't have practices that can remove salt. What you can do is reduce the amount of salt that is applied. And if you do use a sand grit mix, do remember that there is an issue with it after you've used it over the course of a winter. Make sure you inspect and repair your infiltration-based practices like bioretention or like permeable pavement to make sure they're not clogged.
from all the sand and grit that have been applied. And if they have been, then you just unclog them. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the, to the teeth of the maintenance. That's not the purpose of, of this particular uh, seminar. But it has been a real pleasure to, to be with you today. And I don't, I guess, have an opportunity to answer any of your questions live, but hopefully at some point in the future I will. And I wanted to close with a, a beautiful picture of one of the most special places in North America where our two countries meet. Have a great day, and thanks for your attention.